Welcome, welcome. You're listening to our podcast, Two Massage Therapists and a Microphone. My name is Mark. I'm a registered massage therapist, registered kinesiologist here in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And hopefully you guys have been digging on all the stuff that we've been putting out for you guys. I've got something really cool lined up. I screwed I screwed up the scheduling last week. I'm sorry. That is completely my fault. We were scheduled to have Rebecca on our podcast and I made some grave errors with some scheduling and she's nice enough to take some time out of her super busy life to sit down with us. Well, she's not really sitting down with us. She is probably, where are you sitting? I'm looking at the screen. We're doing a Facebook Live, and I'm going to extract the audio from this. And I'm staring at the screen now trying to figure out where you're sitting. I'm in my office. It's it's in my, I work from home, and I'm just in my cool office in, my, in the basement. Right on, right house. on. So <laughs> I'm hanging out in my office in Toronto. You're hanging out in your office in Utah. Um, Rebecca, why don't you, yeah. why don't you uh, mm-hmm. give a little bit of an intro to yourself, and then we'll start wrapping on some of the cool things that you do. Cool. Okay. So my name is Rebecca D. Azevedo Overson. I know that's a mouthful, but. Half of my life was Rebecca D. Azevedo. Half of my life was Rebecca Overson. So I just kind of use them both. But um, my, you know, my peeps call me Rebecca Overson. Um, I live in Salt Lake City, Utah, right at the base of the Rocky Mountains. Um, you know, ten minutes from my door to world ca- world class uh, ski resorts, snowboarding, and all of that yeah. good stuff. And everything that Utah is famous for, right? Um, And I've been a licensed massage therapist since 1995. I went went to massage school immediately after graduating from high school when I was 17. And and then I, you know, I had to wait till I turned 18 to be able to get a license. (laughs) So I was, you know, at the time, the youngest person ever graduate from that school, because most people are still in high school when they're 18, but I got a head start. So I've been in this field now for more than half my life. I'm currently at the time of this recording, actually turned 42 in exactly 30 days. So um, it's just been, you know, an awesome 20, whatever the math is, 23, 24 year uh, uh, career with some interesting twists. Right on, right on. Um, So graduated high school. What made you want to go to massage therapy school like right away? Like, was this something that you've always wanted to do? No, actually, I wanted to be a police officer. (laughs) <laughs> I wanted to. I wanted to go into law enforcement. I had my heart set on a career. All right, in you got to give me the story on this. Then I want to uh, know how do you how you went how do you how do you weird? go from wanting to uh, to to sport a badge and a gun and uh, now you're now you're a therapy <laughs> master. How does that work? <laughs> I know, right? Well, I've always i i I was a lifeguard. Actually, my first job in high school, I was a lifeguard because. You know, so a little backstory is I actually skipped a grade. I skipped kindergarten. And so I was always a year younger than all of the right. people in my grade. And so that made for a lot of painful social situations because my parents would not let me date until I was 16, which was like halfway through my junior were you, year were you, high school. Were you sneaking right? dates, though? I, Be honest. No, no. I mean, they let me go out with groups of friends. But no, I mean, my dad, I came from a very religious gotcha. Mormon family. Um, and, and, and my dad had like a stern interview with like any guy guy that wanted to invite me to like a homecoming <laughs> dance or something like that. So, so, uh, my dad was very strict that way, but God bless him. I'm actually one of oh, 10 wow. children. So, um, yeah. So my dad, my parents were running like a home enterprise that way too. Just where do you fall in? Where do you fall into but the anyway, mix of the 10? I, uh, I'm number six. So I have actually nine biological siblings. And then my parents divorced when I was in high school. My dad is remarried twice and his current wife, Hopefully, it's last. Uh, Will uh, she? She has a, a son that gotcha. my dad adopted. So I do have an adopted brother who's, you know, he's only like fifteen, and I have nieces and nephews that are like way older than him. But you know, he he is technically <laughs> a brother. <laughs> so well, I grew up in a family of nine kids, but I, I currently have nine siblings. Who oh wow! My adopted brother, All right. So, so, so sorry, I interrupted yeah. you on the so cops. <laughs> So cops. So I loved watching cops. You know, the show, I don't know if they have that in Canada, but in the US, it's like the bad boys, bad boys, what you gonna do? What you gonna do when they come for you? It was this show where they'd have like live cameras on police, you know, police activity. And I just loved watching that show in high school. And I just thought, I don't know, I just I just thought it would be fun. I thought it'd be a cool thing. But anyway, I was saying I, I was a lifeguard. Um, so because that was a job I could get when I was 15. So here in the States, you you know, usually can't get a job until you're about 16, but lifeguards, they let you do that at 15. So, so that was cool. Cause I could just get a job like everybody else in my grade had. And I loved, I loved being a lifeguard. And in fact, my, my friends, my peers called me the enforcer because I just, 
I just stood there with my hands on my, like I took that job so damn seriously. Like I was like, I wasn't just sitting there to get a tan. I was protecting the kids. I was enforcing the rules. I was like, you know what I mean? Like I just, I, I, I thrive really well in intense situations. Mm -hmm. I found like, I, I just do really well. So I like the CPR, the first aid, the crisis intervention. I really like that. So I just thought, why not be a cop? That would be cool. Right. And then how this happened was, you know, um, my senior year in high school, um, I met, so I was also a varsity cheerleader. I was, I was an athlete. I, I, I played on the soccer team. I did cheerleading for three years. Um, and I was also on the diving, the, mm -hmm. the diving team and I was a former gymnast. So, so diving came really easy for me and I liked that. But I, um, at the time at, at cheerleading camp, my senior year, I met a guy, um, made a bunch of friends from different schools. And one of them, his name was Matt Harrison. He was on the cheerleading squad of an, a rival, rival mm -hmm. school. Right. And um, I had a had pain, I had an issue, I had a, a shoulder issue or something at cheerleading camp. And he said, here, let me show you, let me do something to you. I said, okay. So we're just sitting out on the grass and he, he puts this, I think it was actually my ankle that was hurting. And he puts his hands on my ankle and he starts doing what I now know is unwinding, like craniosacral right. unwinding, right? Now, keep in mind, I'm like 16 years old. I, I'm no, I've, I've never had a massage in my life. And I didn't really know what body work was. So I was like, well, what are you doing? And he said, well, I'm just listening to your body. I'm just helping you facilitate, blah, 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 all these words. And I said, what, the, what are you, who are you? What is this? And he said, my parents, he said, my parents both do therapeutic body work. And I was like, what is that? And so he just kind of taught, gave me this little sample of like muscle memory and the intelligence of muscles because both of his parents were licensed massage therapists. And he was the oldest in his family, oldest of like four or five kids. So long story short, he and I became fast friends. He was actually one of my dearest, best, best friends um, through the rest of high school and, and into our adult lives. And we're still in touch even today because I started having other pains and injuries. And he said, Beck, you should just go to my mom. You should just have my mom work on you. So again, long story short, I end up on Debbie's massage table and never had any kind of experience like this before ever 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 and i'm laying they had a room in their house where they did body work and saw clients while the little kids were like in the next room playing super mario brothers on the nintendo you know like it was a very like chill mm -hmm. kind of family environment and i'm laying there on this inflatable mattress on top of a massage table i never got undressed there was no oil there's no sheets there's no draping she had all kinds of strange things in her office that i'd just never seen before and she proceeds to do all these craniosacral holds. Again, I had no idea, but she was explaining to me, oh, I'm monitoring this flow of your cerebral spinal fluid. I was like, <laughs> okay, lady, I don't feel like you're doing anything, but I believe you, right? <laughs> so, and then she's like, oh, okay, did you feel that release? Oh, that's better. I'm like, I didn't feel shit. <laughs> I didn't feel anything. But I thought it was fascinating that she could. At least she seemed very convinced that she could. Mm -hmm. You know, and then she moves to my feet and my ankles and she does this unwinding and she starts telling me all these things about my body. And I had just met her. I didn't mm. even do an intake. Uh, she didn't ask me anything. And the most surprising thing, she's talking about my ankles and she's like, seems like you like really sprained maybe your right ankle or something. And I was like, um, I totally did. And how did you know that? You know, like weird. Now she's really got my attention. Then she moves and does an abdominal, like a thoracic not thoracic, uh, you know, respiratory yep. diaphragm hold. And she starts telling me, she's like, cause you've got a lot of tension in your abdomen. Like, have you been doing a lot of sit-ups? And I'm like, <laughs> no. And I'm just laying there thinking, this is so weird. I just need help for my shoulder, you know? And she, she, I, I was laying there and all of a sudden I felt like she was pulling a black tennis ball out of my abdomen. It felt like this big black ball of tar. And I really was the most bizarre thing I've ever, I think, experienced in my life. And I was pretty open to like spiritual experiences at that age, you know, like I, I was a little <laughs> blue -blue growing up, you know, and, and, um, and I felt like she pulled this black tennis ball out of my body and I totally started sobbing. I had this full blown emotional release. And now I'm like, okay, really lady, oh, wow. what are you doing? And she, she said, well, what are you feeling? I said, I don't know. She said, sure you do. I said, I, 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 I'm, I'm just, I'm angry. She's like, okay, great. What are you angry about? And I was like, I don't know. And she's like, well, who should I ask? <laughs> and it was like, she gave, she just walked me through this awakening experience, which was realizing. So my parents were going through a divorce right. at that time. And I was really angry with my mother. I, I, I blamed a lot of things on my mother. I didn't really know what was going on, but I just thought my mom was 
the problem or something. So I felt this anger and she's over my liver and tells me how your body handles your emotions. And in Chinese medicine, your liver and gallbladder or anger and resentment. I mean, it was like this holy moly moment of self-discovery of realizing that my body was taking care of emotions that I wasn't even aware of, let alone right. dealing with, like that my physical body had intelligence was absolutely life altering realization for me. And so she helped me process all the stuff. I kept going back, kept going back. I don't think I ever even paid her. I think she just worked on me out of my <laughs> pity or something. I, you know, I just, I just, it was, I, I it was so life changing and so empowering to realize that my physical symptoms, my ankle, my shoulder, all these issues I was having, she helped me really trace it back to an emotional core. And I just said, what, what are you? What is this profession? And she said, well, I'm, I do therapeutic body work. And I said, but how did you learn this? She said, well, you have to go to massage therapy school. So I'm a licensed massage therapist, but then I got training through the Upledger Institute and so naming all these things that of course we're all <laughs> familiar with, right? But it was absolutely brand new for me. And I just said, I want to do this. I want to do what you do. I want to do it. And she said, okay, great. Go and enroll at the Myotherapy College of Utah. I said, okay, great. And I did. I swear to God, like that day, I told my parents, hey, I want to be a massage therapist. They were like, mm, okay, whatever. That's like saying you want to go to beauty <laughs> school. Okay, like whatever. And I went down there and I, and I just, I knew that was my calling. I wanted to help people wake up. I wanted to help people heal themselves. I wanted to help them make those meaningful connections and discoveries. And if that was what Debbie did, I just wanted to follow in her footsteps. So she was really a mentor to me in so many ways and put me on that path. And it was, it was fantastic. It was just, it was like, of course, this is what I'm going to, it was just so profound. But I also thought, you know, I was raised as a, as a member of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, mm -hmm. the, you know, Mormon, Mormon church and Mormons that were, you know, very big on traditional male, female roles and the woman stay home and have the kids and raise the family and the husband go out and work and all that stuff. Right. And I didn't, I, I, I kind of thought, what nice Mormon boy would want to marry a lady cop? Like, it just kind of didn't, you know, I'm, eventually I'm going to have babies. I'm going to be pregnant. I, I'm not going to be out on the streets. You know what I mean? Like I, I had a conflict of values there at the time. And I, while I don't embrace those values anymore, that was very, very much a guiding mm. post in my life. And so I kind of thought, okay, well, being a lady cop isn't really going to work given these other things I really want for my family. But I saw Debbie and her husband at the time, Charlie, and they were this, you know, raising a family, doing body work out of their house. And I was like, Oh, this I could get into. I can work from home. I can set my own hours. I can have kids. You know, I just thought it would be the coolest thing in the world. And so I just jumped in just, Hook, line, and sinker. That was it for me. I was done. That's crazy. You know? That's so, I, I don't know many. Right? I don't know many people <laughs> that went straight into massage therapy from high school. I mean, I did a podcast with uh, with another right. gentleman, Scott Linquist, and he 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 did the same thing. He kind of went straight from high school, but he he was doing it because you know he was like the formal college route is just is not my thing. He just needed something different, yeah. And yeah. he just felt like, oh, you know, I was born yeah. to do this. Yeah. I was conditioned, actually, is the way he said it. I've been doing it for so long that it just felt like the natural fit for me to do. Yeah, and it was, there was a lot of that, too. Like, I remember in my high school health class, we did a segment, a semester, on, or a week or two weeks on stress relief. And our teacher taught us how to do, like, hand right. massages. And I thought it was so cool. And I loved, like, when I'd go and have sleepovers with my girlfriends or our church group or something. And I was like... Let me give you a foot massage. Let me get like, I, I just, I was good at it. And I felt I'm by, I'm very a nurturing human being anyway. I can't ever imagine I would have survived as a cop. It probably would have mm. destroyed my soul, you know, but it was just this, it, it felt very natural. You know, I have little brothers and sisters. I changed a lot of diapers. I, I just took care of the people around me. You know what I'm saying? And it was like, it was just like, I liked being in that helping role. It, it gave me a lot of satisfaction as a, as a young person to feel like I could contribute meaningfully for other people. So my plan was kind of go to massage school and then put myself mm -hmm. through medical school, you know, but that's a whole other story that I didn't go to medical school, but <laughs> so that was kind of my plan I was like, wow, I can get a really, I can work as a massage therapist and be making 50 <laughs> bucks an hour while all my friends are working at mcdonald's for minimum wage you know what i'm saying like i i felt like i was putting myself at a good advantage if i wanted to have a career in the medical field and um you know again that didn't quite pan out like i thought i mean 
a lot of people know that part of my story is I actually struggled for eight years and then quit massage therapy because I couldn't oh, yeah. make a living. <laughs> so, all right. So, yeah, you know, what? right. So there, there's so many, like I said, lots of twists and so turns in the story. Before we get to your career path <laughs> then, because I'm, I'm really curious of your career path. Yeah. Did you, did you end up resolving yeah. all that stuff with your mother? Oh yeah. Yeah. Totally did. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, because it was this awakening, it was this anger, it was realizing I had all these issues on my left side of my body, which was my female side. I was very, uh, so the other reason why I wanted to be a cop was I was a total tomboy in high school. Absolute tomboy. I didn't wear a stitch of makeup, makeup never tweezed my eyebrows. I didn't even <laughs> shave my legs. Like I, I wore boxer shorts. Like I what just, I did not like being a girl. I thought girls were dumb. I didn't, all of my friends were guys. Literally, I ran around with this pack of 20 guys and just me. And I was so proud to just be like in with the dudes. It was just, you know, like it was something I was very, very proud of, but it was all being reflected in my mom issues that I was really in denial yeah. of my own femininity. And so I really definitely don't, I mean, you know, my whole life has been about healing. And so I've, I've definitely um, done a ton of my own inner work and and all that stuff and, and healed that and resolved that. And I have a great relationship with my mother. I love her. And I also love being a woman. And I, you know, like I, I grew up and, and grew out of a lot of those. Isn't it a weird sure. dichotomy though? Like to, so. to, to be into cheer and everything else, but yet be tomboyish. Yeah. I was a cheerleader who didn't shake yeah, that's, my legs. That's kind of weird, isn't it? It all is right, so totally weird. But I was, but it was more of like this. I was like this kind of feminist, like you're not going to, you're not going to, you know, strong arm me into, to partaking of your modern day sexualization rituals. You know, now I didn't have like super hairy <laughs> legs. It's like little kids have a little blonde, yeah. maybe fine hair, you know, it was no, but it was always this big deal. Everyone was like trying to do all these dares to get Becky de Azevedo <laughs> to shave her legs. <laughs> you know, like it was just kind of ridiculous, but it was, it was me just marching to the, to my own beat and just feeling like, you know, I'm gonna, I'm going to be, be true to myself and but for me, cheerleading was athletics. I mean, I was a former gymnast, so I could tumble. I could, I was really strong. I could do, I could do more pushups than most of the guys. I could bench press mm -hmm. my own weight. Like I, I was, I was a tough chick. And for me, cheerleading was not only social, but it was athletic. Uh, um, as well. I asked this of anyone that brings up cheer. What do you think of bring it on? <laughs> I never saw it. <laughs> I suck at movies. That's one thing. Like all my people in my life know, but they're like, oh, have you ever seen? The Shawshank Redemption. I'm like, nope. Like, have you ever seen Fifty Shades of Grey? I'm like, nope. Have you ever seen uh, When Harry Met Sally? No, I have not. Like, I don't watch movies. I rarely go out for movies. And I'm so, as as way. a as a former lifeguard, what do you think of what do you think of Baywatch? <laughs> Again, you didn't, didn't really watch, watch that because I was watching the Beverly Hills. No, because look, I was a nice, super sweet, pure, holy Mormon girl, and to be like chicks with giant boobs and bikinis wasn't exactly allowed yeah, on our TV you, screen. So my parents were pretty restrictive about the media we allowed in that. our home, music, and and I never, I never saw an R-rated movie. I, I, I can count on one hand how many R-rated movies I've seen. <laughs> like because I, I grew up, it, that was like an edict of our like church. It was like keep your thoughts yeah, here, yeah. keep your like don't. Don't feed your mind garbage. And so I think the first R-rated movie I saw was Schindler's List. But And then I also saw Saving Private Ryan. But my dad said, I want you to see these movies right. because this is history. This is history. And you need to appreciate what your grandfather did for you in World War II. And you know what I mean? Like that, yeah, kind, yeah, of, yeah. that kind of stuff. So, um, But never the gratuitous violence and certainly not sexual scandals and all those kinds of things. That was a very holy and righteous. All right. Girl. So now, now, now the holy, righteous little girl – finds herself in massage <laughs> school and now you finish massage school give us give us the career path then yes. i'm really curious about that so yeah so actually interestingly enough right after i graduated um the the education director approached me and he said rebecca i'd like to offer you a job as the registrar at the school i'd like you to be on the administration of the school and i thought why and he said well our current registrar <laughs> you know such the person that registers everyone for their classes and all of that stuff. She says she's pregnant and she's having a baby and she won't be coming back. And he says, you know, you've got good grades, you're sharp, you know, and I'd always was a little, a little, a little too big for my britches or wise beyond my years kind of thing. I was a very, very mature, um, young person, you know, so, so he, um, gave me a job at the school. So I ended up on staff at the school, and I was also just doing body work on the side. So I ended up teaching. I, I did all kinds of cool things there for a little bit. And then I was just building my practice on the side and, and had some really wonderful people that helped me, supported me. I had a, a neighbor that had an extra room in her house that 
Um, she wanted, she basically gifted to me in exchange for, you know, a weekly body work session or something like that. And she even, uh, when I graduated, she gave me a, a box of business cards with my name and phone number and all, on it. You know, like I just had so many people around me that just loved and supported me that I always believed that mm -hmm. I could do this. And I knew I was skilled. I mean, I, I did all the upledger training. I did all of that stuff and was doing like really awesome healing sessions with people when I was like 19 years old. When I look back and I go, oh my gosh, most of the 19 year olds I'm around, at least these days, I'm just like, yeah. they're like babies. They're just babies to me now. And I look back and I think I was really doing some pretty high level emotional awareness and healing and body work when I was a child practically, right? So I, I loved it. I was very good at it. I could have good rapport with people. I was confident. But I always struggled to support myself. Like I always had to have some other job, you know, and, and, you know, whether that was working at a deli or a coffee shop or at the massage school or, or whatever. But I always had this nagging dream that I, I just really, really, really wanted to be self, self employed. Like this was before franchises. There was no place to work as a massage therapist unless you worked for one of the spas at the ski right. resorts around here. And so being self employed was like the obvious and only option for me. But I just really, really struggled at it for for years. I moved out of that home office. I got my own office downtown Salt Lake City. And then I kind of moved to like the middle of the valley. And I was building, but I just couldn't support myself. And I didn't quite know why. It didn't. I got a little upset because mm -hmm. Debbie, you know, my mentor, when I asked her how does she find clients, she just said word of mouth. So I just kind of decided that like if you're really good, then you're just going to have this rave following because all your clients are just going to talk you up. And so because I didn't have quite the following that I had envisioned, I just started getting a little bit resentful of my mm. clients, which is an interesting place to be, yeah. resenting your clients for not referring people to you. So, you know, there's some things that I were real sticking points that back then I just kind of thought, well, I don't mm -hmm. just keep trying. And then years and years later, you know, I did have some jobs. I did work in a, a fitness club. I worked in a personal training studio. I worked at the cliff spot at snowbird to get a free season pass <laughs> for snowboarding. And, you know, like I had some good jobs, but I just bounced around a lot and I did have a few clients. I would do out calls and, you know, just luckily for me, I have a big ass family. So we just have a lot of connections, just a lot of people through church and community and family that were just like, Oh yeah, Becky does body work. Go, go get a massage, yeah. you know, like that kind of stuff. But it just, I didn't really know what to do and how to really do it. And so this was in 2000, let's see, 2000, um, 2001, I want to say that I moved to Virginia you know, on the East Coast, the suburbs of Washington, D.C., because I was so far in debt. Um, I think I had even spent like $5,000 on this like week-long entrepreneur kind of business building rah-rah mm -hmm. thing. I had gone way into debt to try to solve this problem and nothing worked. So I had to tuck my tail between my legs and my dad said, why don't you, and by the way, I did get married and divorced in there. I got married when I was 21 and divorced by the time I was 22. Oh, wow. <laughs> so there was a few like, like, a, right, a few little, and Mormons are famous for their, you know, like most, a lot of, again, this was back then and times have changed significantly in the last 20 years. But, you know, my mom got married when she was 19 mm -hmm. and immediately started having kids and had nine children. So. For me, it was like, oh, my gosh, if I'm not married by the time I'm 21, there must be something wrong with me. You know, so that was kind of a silly, very emotionally and spiritually immature place to be. But so it had all these like hard yeah. hits, you know, and my dad just looked at me one day and said, why don't you move with your sister to Virginia? Why don't you just get out of Utah and just go be a part of another culture and a different part of the country? And I think it'll be a good learning experience for you. And so. I did. I, and I, and I didn't admit failure to my clients. Because I didn't have to because it was kind of like, well, I'm moving. Goodbye, everybody. But I had such a hard time saying that I was basically giving up on my career. You know, when I moved to Virginia, I got a full-time office administrative job for a Fortune 500 company. And I, I, I rocked at that. I was really, really good at that. And then I it took me about nine months to get my license in Virginia because I had to take the, the MBLEX, which I didn't have to take in Utah. So I had to study and, you know, get relicensed. And then I started building a clientele mm -hmm. again on the side. And it was great. And I was actually building. It was really awesome. I lived in the wealthiest county in the nation at the time, Fairfax County, Virginia. So people were just stressed working 80 hours a week and getting lost. So of were you doing so it was, anything? It was, it was, were you doing anything you know, different then that you were doing in Utah? I, th I think, yeah. What I tried different was, okay, I did a lot of woo-woo stuff mm -hmm. when I was in Utah. I did a lot of, like, you know, maybe by woo-woo, it's kind of this jokey phrase we use, but like, I was doing all kinds of like energy healing and 
you know, even craniosacral is a little yeah. woo woo for people. It's yeah, like, it's, it's tough for someone to right? swallow if they don't. So know. I was trying to totally, and I think you know, I was I was searching, I was getting trained in all of these very very metaphysical DNA healing types of therapies because I thought, well, I just need more awesome modalities, and mm -hmm. that will get me clients. That's not true, right? But that's what I was thinking. And then eventually I just kind of had a little come to Jesus. It's kind of <laughs> funny that I use that term because I was going to say, I realized I was trying to play Jesus with people. Like I was really thinking I needed to just heal everything about, you know, I needed to have this magical secret super healing laying on a mm -hmm. hand power or something. And I thought, Rebecca, you just lost your way. How about just do massage? Like just do straight up massage for stress and pain mm -hmm. and relaxation. And so I stopped doing all of that new agey stuff and I just did straight up massage therapy, mm -hmm. Swedish mm -hmm. massage, sports massage. Right. And that made it a lot easier because. Can I ask you a question about the woo woo stuff? Do you think that yeah. the, that, that you might've yeah. struggled with your practice with the woo woo stuff because you were so young? Do you know what I mean? Like, like the gen, like the, the public could, might could perceive you differently if you seem like a little old or a little bit more hippie. Like, do you know what I mean? And then, and 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 the woo woo <laughs> stuff versus be. like you know you're kind of you're kind of trying to rock this. You know, being being relatively young. You know, it, it, that could have been a factor, right? Yeah, yeah, I think it could have been. But also, I really do think because I, I was exceptionally, I was pretty well mm -hmm. received actually to that end. But I didn't know how to say right. what I did. I didn't know. So with what I coach my students now, right, what I know the mistake I was making was I did not have clear marketing messaging and I did not know what problem mm -hmm. I solved. And I was running around trying to educate people about how awesome craniosacral was or Neuralink was or consent. I mean, just all these things that I did. I was like running around trying to just be this infomercial of explaining what mm -hmm. I did to people. I just lost them, just lost them. And sometimes I remember one time one of my good friends from high school, actually I've known her since I was nine years old. We were cheerleaders together, soccer, everything. She called me up one day and said, I need a good point with you. I said, great. She came in and I started doing all this weird woo woo stuff. And I remember she just looked at me about halfway through and goes, I, 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 I really just need a massage. And I was like, well, a massage isn't going to help you. We need to repattern your DNA and we need to do all this muscle testing. And she was just like, you're weird. <laughs> right? Like I, I was not, I was not. I was forcing something on people that they didn't want. And there was just a ton of confusion about mm -hmm. what I even did. I couldn't even know how to talk about it. So that was a big fatal mistake I think I was making. And once I switched over to just straight up massage, people were like, oh, I dig that. I know what that is. And so it was, I was able to build a clientele much faster because I was just giving massages. And I was really good at it too. I, I studied Lomi Lomi. I did like I did a lot of really cool um, things with body work and, and rhythm and, and just I mm -hmm. it was like a dance. I loved it. I loved doing massage, you know. So and then I met the guy. I moved back to Utah because I met the guy that I ended up marrying and having two children with. We're no longer married, but we were married for um, 10 years. I met him and then moved back to Utah. And that's when I just really finally quit massage. Because I was like, you know what? I had great success in Virginia, but I am not going back to Utah where there are like literally five massage schools within yeah. 10 miles of each other. And the market is so saturated. I don't even want to do this again. I don't want to start over again. So I stuck with office work. And I just, I just, people were like, are you still doing massage? I was like, nope, I'm not. I'm retired. <laughs> I'm not doing it anymore, you know. And then I had my babies. I had two boys mm -hmm. in two years. And I, I was very conscious about my childbirth choices. And I actually gave birth at home. Nice. With midwives in a birthing tub. Right. had a water birth. And it was so so incredible to me that all I wanted to do was talk about how awesome mm -hmm. birth can be. And um, years before I'd had a friend approach me that said, I want to start a prenatal massage clinic with you. And I was like, Ooh, that's kind of a cool idea. Like I'd always been around pregnancy and birth. My goodness. I'm, I have mm -hmm. five sisters and my mother had nine kids. Right. So we'd always been interested in pregnancy and birth, but um, I didn't really take it seriously until after I'd given birth to my own children and when I was pregnant, I found a really hard, it was a very hard thing to find a massage therapist that would work on me while I was pregnant right, that right. knew what they were doing. You know, I'd, I'd, they'd be like, oh, we can't, you're in your first trimester. You can't get a massage. I was like, bullshit. What are you talking about? I was like, oh, we can't rub your feet. I'm like, my feet are killing me. You have to rub my feet. That's why I'm here. Oh, we don't want to put you in labor. I'm like, I promise you're not going to put me in labor. You know what I mean? Like I just was so tired of fighting, of knowing more than the massage therapist because I actually took prenatal massage in 96 and I even taught it at the school that I went to. So I knew a lot about it, 
but I was so sick as a client, as a consumer, going through all of these myths right. and misconceptions. And I and I was also I got the birth bug. I was just very I just really wanted to empower birthing women. And so my my former spouse and I were talking one day and he said, Rebecca, I think you should um you should do prenatal massage. So in between there, you know, I worked for this company. I had left the company. I did life coaching for a while because I was gonna be a stay at home mom with my kids. And then my husband in two thousand eight in the real estate crash, he was in real estate. We lost oh, everything wow. overnight, no income, no commissions, mm-hmm. no nothing. And so I was forced to go back to work and I thought I could go get an administrative job for $12 an hour, or maybe I could do body work and maybe I could do prenatal and that would be really awesome because I love pregnant women. You know, like it was this passion that, that came through me and the stars aligned and I started my prenatal massage practice oh, wow. in 2009. And it was an immediate, immediate success immediate, like ridiculous, 150% growth first year to the next. And then, and then, and then like I, I was doing six figures just a couple years into my practice, hiring employees outgrew my space five times in eight years. Like it was a huge, huge, huge success that I'm still, even though I don't own it, I sold it this year. Mm-hmm. I'm still known for that. I just got a text yesterday from a friend saying, can my sister book a prenatal massage with you? <laughs> like, no, <laughs> I sold the, I sold the company, you know? So that was a huge, um, you know, like struggle, struggle. And then all of a sudden, like total, total success in high demand um, and actually ma- supporting mm-hmm. my family. I, my husband wasn't working. I was the, I was the breadwinner, you know, that was really cool. That that felt very fulfilling for me to not totally throw in the towel, but to actually make a really big comeback and to go out victoriously was a nicer end to that story. Yeah. If you know what I mean? Nobody likes to fail. <laughs> I hear that. <laughs> right? I hear you. Go out, you know? go out on top. So, is what you did on that one. eh? Right. Totally. So then totally. when does the art of building a successful massage practice come into the mix? So that's my Facebook group, which I know I think yeah. you're a member of it or you've been around it. So, so two years ago, um, I knew I was going to sell or I was, I knew I was going to sell or close my practice. I just knew I was, I knew I was done. I actually gave birth to a baby girl two years ago and that closed that mm-hmm. chapter for me. I just didn't want to do it anymore. I was done. I had fulfilled all my goals and then some, and I just knew, okay, Rebecca, there's something else for you. And I knew even at the beginning of Salt Lake prenatal massage, my, my practice, I knew I wasn't going to do it forever. I even told my coach when I started that practice, I had a coach back then. I said, I'm not going to do this forever. This is a mm-hmm. stepping stone, you know? So I knew that time was coming and I started looking around at this hodgepodge of skills that I had. I had turned into a kick-ass businesswoman who actually knew what she was doing, right? I was also a really skilled body worker. I had struggled and failed. I'm also a professional entertainer, so I love being on, on camera. I love public speaking. I love... You know, there's just so many things. I just thought, okay, like, okay, God, universe, what is it? Like, what's, what's mm-hmm. the next step for me? And it just started showing up all over that that um, that not all the other therapists around me were succeeding. Some of them started to come out of the woodwork and they just said, how are you doing this, Rebecca? You're like a monster. I mean, in a good way, right? They were like, you are just this like, everybody's talking about you in the massage community and especially in the birth community. It was just like, you just like world domination right here. Mm-hmm. How did you do it? And I thought, I don't know, isn't everybody doing this? I'm just over here in my corner of the world. And I realized that I had some, I'd kind of cracked the code on something. And so I figured out, you know, like, gosh, what if I could create, what if I could help other massage therapists that were struggling and really shorten that right. struggle for them? I mean, if I had had somebody like me in my life at the beginning, it'd be a totally different story and a totally different life. And I started to get really excited about what if I could coach and mentor other massage therapists to build successful private practices without making costly mistakes, without, you know, just trial and error, throwing spaghetti at the wall and seeing mm-hmm. if it sticks, right? So I kind of, you know, and I did, a, I invested a lot in this kind of education. I hired coaches, I had mentors, like, how do I do this? And I started this Facebook group and it grew really, really quickly. And while it was growing, I was also writing an eight week program, an eight week mentoring program. And I just looked at, if I had to do this all over again, what would I do differently? You know, or what did I learn? And could I walk people through it? And I knew I was a great coach. I knew I was a great body worker. I knew I was a successful massage therapist. And so even though I'd never coached a massage therapist at the time to build a private practice, right. I, I knew I could do it. You know what I mean? It was like, it was like, 
it's like that first massage that you ever give and you're like okay i like do i really know what i'm doing you're like yeah you know what you're doing just go for it right so i created this program and i just started i just opened it up to the people in my facebook group I just started posting about like, hey, I'm taking five students and I enrolled people. It's actually a very um, high ticket program. It's an expensive program. It is not, mm -hmm. it's an investment. You know, it, it's not, it's not a cheap thing. So I had to learn how to do that too. I had to learn, I had to overcome a lot of my own fears and insecurities and, and really stand for the value of what I was helping people to do. And I now for over two years ish now, about two years now, I now have a very successful track record of helping massage therapists make a thousand to four thousand extra dollars every month, you know, to really grow their practice in a short, short period of time because they have strategy and they have the right mindset. They have accountability. Like it actually works really well. And I've had the pleasure of working with um, students, massage therapists in five different countries, including the U.S. and Canada, obviously, but um, all over the world, and it's been so amazing. I, I love it. I love, I love being a champion for the success mm -hmm. of this industry and helping therapists just, I, I call it my, my program is called Rock Your Massage Practice Academy. And it's like, um, and by the way, I just, the, the website is Rock Your Massage Practice. I think it's rockyourmassagepractice.com. <laughs> I think I would know my I, own URL. I love the name. Like, I love it's, the name. Yeah, it's rockyourmassagepractice.com because I, I feel like I want to turn them into rock stars. I want them to feel like I am rocking. I'm not struggling, but I am kicking ass and taking names and really fulfilling my calling and my purpose and my passion, you know, not just to make a difference as a body worker, but to right. also make a living, you know, you you deserve to do that. And lots of us don't know how to do that, you know? So problem solved. That's what I do now. And, and once that really took off, I knew that it would probably be the best thing for me to close my practice. So I actually closed it. I gave it away to my employees. And then I had a former employee show up and said, Oh, the hell you're going to close this. She said, mm -hmm. this is my dream. And I want to, I want to carry on your legacy. So in the midst of all of that, we negotiated a buyout of all of the assets and she purchased it. She owns the website, the name, the software, the everything, and she's right she's on. now running it. And that happened in in March of this year. So it's really nice to know that my my legacy lives on, and my creation is now uh, a gift to somebody else who wanted to build a business just like that. But she got to take it from me and take it from there. You know, so it's uh, it was just a win win. It was all I'm just a firm believer of that, like everything works in my favor and that divine timing is all there is. And so it was just all this like perfect, perfect everything, you know. Um, and yeah, so that's what I do full time now. I have like literally full time, 30, 40 hours a week. I am with my students. We're doing coaching calls. We're doing like it's, so it's the, just the best. So the, co I love it. the coaching stuff. Then, love it. So that's a one on one time you're spending with uh, with your students. It's actually a group program because I realized pretty quickly if I'm just doing one on one, I can only work with yeah. like five people a month. And that's not going to do it here. I actually really want to elevate the industry. And so I had to figure out how can I do this in and reach more people and affect more people. So it's a group program. They do get some one on one support from me and my team. Um, but that mostly we do, uh, it's a private Facebook group for questions and assignments, but then we do live group Q and a calls every week and, and really move them through the curriculum and help them troubleshoot their unique problems. You know, I help them solve every problem they have. I help them. Solve I love this uh, because so it's a we group, don't have a lot of, yeah. at least not that I've seen a lot of massage therapy business coaches and i've gotten in touch with a couple of you guys down there yeah. because i really love what you guys do i see the social media and i'm so into it and i wish someone would do that up here it's it's just lacking to be honest with you um the massage yeah. therapists up here don't yeah. really kind of they they can't wrap their head around the business side of it they're they're very still much you know I'm, you know, I want to help people. Yes, I understand you want to help people, but at the end of the day, if you if you can't make enough money to keep your doors open, you're really not helping anybody. Exactly. Yeah, and I define success. I have this webinar that a lot of people find me through. It's on Facebook. It's called Five Shifts for Creating a Successful Massage Practice. You can actually access it if you just go to my my Facebook page. My business page is called Rebecca Overson, so you can just find me that way. But it's um, there's a an ad uh, there that you know you can. Uh, just it's a free webinar and and a 60 minute training on the five shifts that you absolutely must make in order to create a successful massage practice and one of those is you know recognizing that success is three things it's doing what you love it's making a difference and it's making a living and if you don't have all three of those things you're mm -hmm. going to be unfulfilled right so so that's really important and actually I love I've worked with a ton of students in Canada 
And they've helped me to understand the market in Canada, like a registered massage therapist, you're part of the right. healthcare system, so that, that you can't claim to be a specialist. Like I get, I totally get what's going on in Canada. And, if, and actually one of my just super duper rock star uh, students and graduates who's actually now on staff with me in my academy, um, absolutely crushing it. She lives in, in uh, I want to, I think she's in <laughs> Ontario. She's going to kill me if I say the wrong, but I think it's Ontario off the top of my, or no, she's in Toronto. She's in Toronto. She's in the West end of Toronto. Her name is, she, her name is Nikki and she's amazing and has absolutely grown leaps and bounds. And you know, it's, it's so exciting to me to know that here I am in, in my little office in my home in Salt Lake city. You know, I'm a single mom with three kids, you know, and it's like, I'm at home and I really do get to impact therapists mm -hmm. all around the world. I've got clients, uh, therapists in Australia, New Zealand, Ireland, you know, Canada and the U.S. and and growing. And I just, I love it. I love being part of a global community of body workers. It's so cool. So, so yeah, that's my my free Facebook group is for everybody that's a massage therapist that wants to be successful in private practice. I do a ton of free support there, live Q and A's, really great uh, webinars and stuff like that. So everybody's welcome to join that that wants to be a successful solo practitioner. So you can just look it up on Facebook. It's called The Art of Building a Successful Cool, Society. cool. What's the, uh, what's the one yeah. common denominator that you see most most therapists wanting help with? Um, a lot of them literally don't know how to get clients. They just, they, they've been given a lot of bad advice. Like, go throw your business cards all over town. That's the dumbest. Don't ever do that, you guys. That's stupid, right? That's, mm -hmm. There's no strategy in that. Right. So they just they, they literally just sit there. They, they they question themselves. They doubt what they're doing. They know their hands are good, but they're like, why do why can I not get clients or as quickly or as many as I'd like? You know, so that's one of them uh, for sure. It's just the actual strategies for client attraction. And I really got I've got, you know, great solutions for that. Um, but but also I think I think massage therapists spend a lot of time trying to figure stuff out on their own. So there's a ton of like cheap online courses you can take with other business mentors or you can buy like info packs and bundles and PDFs and just do it yourself things. And there's a bunch of great mm -hmm. books out there. But I think when people realize they're swimming in a sea of information and they're just totally overwhelmed because they don't know what applies to them, you know, that's when they come to me and they just go, just give me a plan. Just help me figure this out. And I'm like, I got you, <laughs> you know, because it's 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 mentoring means you've got my wisdom applied to your right. current problem. So there is no actual cookie cutter approach to building a practice because one person might struggle with mindset issues. That's all. That I've got one student right now that her biggest problem is money issues, and that's what we're diving in with her. And other people, it's it's marketing messaging is off, and they're turning away clients without even knowing it. Some people are just not organized, like you know. So they so. So whatever it is that they need, I have a basic eight week curriculum that they all go through, but I do customize things to say, this is what you need to be focusing on. This is your problem. This is your obstacle. And we're going to solve that, you know? So, so yeah, money mindset issues, mm -hmm. lack of strategy, lack of accountability, and just literally total overwhelm, drowning in a sea of information and, and panicking because they're being right, right. swindling. So can you give us maybe two or three usable tools that say like a new grad can uh, start working with right away. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So step number, I love that you asked this because I love to, you know, I want you guys to walk away with not like, Oh, Rebecca, some <laughs> crazy story, but like actual practical tools. Right. So number one, like for new grads, especially number one, realize that just because you're good at massage does not mean you know how to run a business and being self-employed is not for everybody. Don't feel guilty about it. Don't feel like, you know, like if you just want to go massage people and then come home and enjoy, you know, your life, go do that. Go work at a spa, work for a franchise. Not everybody should be self-employed. Not everybody has the grit and tenacity it takes to be an entrepreneur. I like to say I'd rather work 80 hours a week for myself or 24 seven mice for myself than 40 hours a week for anyone else. I am utterly unemployable. I have been self-employed for over 10 years now and there's no way I could ever have a job. I just, it's, you know what I'm saying, right? So just recognize there are, there are, not everybody is going to succeed in solo practice and that's mm -hmm. okay, right? So totally recognize agree. that, okay? And then, you know, okay, get a ton of experience, you know, go work for these awesome franchises and spas and things that are just going to help you figure out and really hone your craft, okay? But then you've got to have a niche. Now I, now niche, sorry <laughs> Canadians, it's niche if you're in Canada. I get corrected all the time by my Canadians. It's niche. I'm like, well, I'm an American. I say niche, right? So, 
So it's like um, a niche, as I describe it, or niche is a problem you solve with your modalities, or it's a population you uniquely serve because of your passions and interests. So a lot of massage therapists confuse. They say, my specialty is reflexology. Nope. Your clients do not care about your modalities. They don't give a shit about your modalities. <laughs> Sorry, my mom's ranch. They really don't. And therapists run around putting all their modalities on their business cards or on yep. their, you know, car magnets or whatever. Stop doing that. Clients don't care what tools you have in your toolbox. A plumber doesn't advertise and saying, I have big wrenches, <laughs> small wrenches, and pipe wrenches. They don't care. You just go, leaky faucets, fixed. You know, they just want to know what problem you solve. And so the niche is a problem you solve or a population you uniquely are situated to serve. Like for me, pregnancy. Why? Because I'm bonkers about it. I love it. I love pregnant women. I love birth. I've helped lots of babies get born. I, I love it, right? I get it. I get what it's like. I get what pregnant women need. As a massage therapist that's been pregnant, I get what they need, okay? Like that, okay? So you have to decide on a niche because... You cannot market to everyone. So that's your third tip. Recognize you cannot market to everyone. Nobody markets. Not even. I love it that you said everybody. that because, like, right? we we actually the other half of what we do at Two Massage Therapists and Microphone, we have a continuing education company called Conant Institute, and we have an entrepreneurship course. Mm. And this is like one of the biggest things that we talk about in our marketing section. And it normally yeah. just blows everyone's yeah. mind away. They're like, "What do you mean? I I I should niche down? What do you mean I should be doing this? What do you mean?" I should create marketing messages that are not intended for the general public. You know, I should really zone in and target. I'm like, no, no <laughs> this is what I mean. This is how you, you want to grow. This is stuff you got to do. Yes. Look, look at all marketing. It's all designed around a problem, even down to mascara. Oh, stubby short lashes. <laughs> mascara can fix that. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, it's all about yes. a problem, you know, so you have to know. And if you don't know, go get lots of experience and just really look at what makes your heart sing and what you're passionate about or what people for years, Mark, people were telling me I should work with pregnant women and children. And I was like, why? I don't even have babies. What's the deal? Like I, I didn't quite take it seriously. And then it was like the light bulb went off and it was underneath yeah. my nose the whole time. Right. So I think that's really important. And, and a lot of therapists get caught up in the scarcity mentality. That's why they think they should advertise to everybody. If you try to advertise, exactly. everybody you're invisible. You, everybody can't. Everybody cannot be your client. Focus on triathletes. Focus on new moms. Focus on, uh, you know, uh, people that sit at a desk all day or people that are on their feet all day. Focus on hairstylists. Focus on like. Now you have to have a niche, but you also have to know that sure. you have a market for it. So not all niches actually have a market, but but the point is you've got to begin to think about, you know, what is my passion in this world? Where can I? You know, what corner of this little garden do mm -hmm. I want to nurture? You know, is it you, you can't say I'm going to grow everything. You're going to say I'm going to grow the best red roses anyone's ever seen, you know, and you have to you have to find what that is. And I like to say my job is to help people pull out their biggest gifts and present nice. them to the world because it's not just about making money. It's about and you have to know how to do that. But it's it's really about your your practice is a vehicle through which you get to make the difference that you feel and felt called to make when you mm -hmm. got into this profession it's a platform for education it's a platform for awareness whether that's depression anxiety um children with autism you know what i mean like what where do you want to fly your flag and say hey people i'm here for you pregnant women i'm here for you like that was my whole thing right my business existed to empower birthing couples. It didn't exist to give mm -hmm. awesome prenatal massages. How we empowered them was by pulling them in with awesome prenatal massages and then enfolding them in all the other things we offered, yoga, doula services. Like It was just pregnancy central, right? So, so I, I, I think that's important. I can't emphasize that enough. People need to think much, much more along those lines of what do I want my practice to, to be a vehicle for sure. in the world? Yeah, and that's like that's the one thing. Like we we start our our marketing course, and we we actually started with the whole concept of like let's change your mindset. That way, you can start to change your practice, and then we get into the whole yes. thing about the importance of understanding and coming up with a mission statement. Like this is where your values are going to be grounded. This is where now you can start to make decisions that make sense for you in your business. And unless you have a mission statement to guide you through this process, you're 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 just you're walking in circles all the time. Right. 
great. You're, you're going to just be looking for, you know, did I make enough money? Did I hit my goal? It's going to become very lifeless. And I, I know there were a lot, my practice was not easy. Yes, it was successful. And it also tore my heart out a million times. You know what I mean? Like I, it was hard with employees and, and, and just issues that came up. It was gut wrenching at times. And the only way I kept going was because I was so freaking inspired by this mm -hmm. vision I had, you know, of, of, of that I am going to make the difference that I am called here to make. And I'm going to deal with this, you know, employee. I had an employee at my front desk quit while I was on my saved up for Christmas vacation on Kauai with my mm. two little boys. I had my front desk quit on day one of my very expensive saved up for mm -hmm. vacation. And I had to run my front desk from Kauai four hours a day while on vacation Whoa. with my kids, like shit like that, where you're just like, why am I doing this? You know, like this sucks. Like why did I sign up for this? Right. But then you get, then I would get these, I'd get these birthday cards and I'd get these letters from my clients that would say, you know, you, changed my life and i had the most powerful birth experience because of what you educated me about and yeah you know what i mean and it was just like okay that's why i'm doing this you know like it's like okay rebecca stop being so selfish like i'm here to to change the culture of birth <laughs> in america you know like that was like my mission right and it fueled me for through, through all of the bullshit that goes on in being a business owner you're gonna have bad days what's gonna get you through you're gonna have failures what's gonna keep you going and that's really for sure, important. for sure. Totally important. You are one yeah. interesting chick, man. I dig it. <laughs> I totally dig it. But we also didn't even talk about the part that I'm against. Oh, that's what, that's, what I, that's what I want to know because to that, Mark. Uh, Rebecca sent I mean, me a video of her sitting down at a keyboard. <laughs> Were you in a bar? Was this at a bar? It's a piano. It's a piano bar. Yes. And yes, that's what I do three nights a week. I'm a headlining well, piano and entertainer. She was throwing down some Eminem, and it was absolutely fabulous. Tell me about this. Tell tell me about the music music side of it because I used to I used to play in a band I'm still I still play a lot of music and I I, I used to play yeah. um until you know you get you got bandmates and sometimes heads 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 right. collide a little bit but anyway which <laughs> yes. way oh, artistic yeah. differences tell, tell me tell me about the music career because I, I I totally dig it oh it's so fun so I'm actually like a fourth or fifth generation musical entertainer okay so my my dad is a Golden Globe nominated composer producer. He worked with the Jackson Five, Sonny and Cher, you know all that. My grandmother and her sisters had a vocal quartet called cool. the King Sisters. They had a television show in the '60s and '70s. My great grandfather. I mean, it just goes back, right? And and that's just what we did in my family. We we're just mus musicians and entertainers. So I started playing the piano when I was seven. And to make a very long story short. Um, I was, um, I fulfilled a dream of mine to be a, a dueling piano player. So uh, dueling piano bars are where mm -hmm. there's two pianos, two piano players sitting facing each other at baby grand pianos. And it's an all request show. It's totally interactive. I just thought how fun would it be to be able to sit down and rock out like Bohemian Rhapsody and get everybody singing mama. Ooh, you know, like I just thought that would be so freaking fun because that's right. what we did in my family. We sat around the piano and we sang. That's what we did. And so I trained and trained and trained and developed the skills and, you know, uh, pop and improv and all of that stuff. And I was finally in 2009, which is the same year I opened my practice. I was, I, I hijacked a piano. The truth is I actually did hijack a piano during a <laughs> piano show at a local piano bar and was promptly offered a job. And ever I was at that bar for three years and then I was recruited by another bar around the corner. And I've been at that bar for over six, almost six or seven years now as um, I do piano show, I'll request dueling piano shows, usually about three nights a week. I've done thousands. I lost count. I've done over two, maybe 3,000 piano shows and people just come up with their tips and their request forms and we sing and play at the same time. So like, you know, I, I don't just play the piano. I, right, right. I perform I, and they're all covers. So anything from Frank Sinatra or, you know, George Gershwin, like summertime, yep, you yep. know, stuff like that. Right. Clear up to Dr. Dre, Eminem, Snoop Dogg. I mean, like, whatever. And the thing is, I actually really love rap. And so whenever people request rap and they bring it to me, they see this 
<laughs> skinny little white blonde chick at a piano that's like throwing down Dr. Dre and dropping f bombs and Dre, and they're just like, "What?" You know. So it's actually a ton of fun. You know, I, I I love it. I love to entertain. I love to make people happy. I love to bring joy to their lives, and that's just one way. Right on. I dig it. And it's a great gig. I make a great is, living too. So you know, it's a great extra stream of income. Is there so. anywhere where we can find you doing this stuff? Like, are you on YouTube all over the place? Like, where would I find you more on 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 the, on the piano throw? Down. Okay, the only things you can really see is on my personal Facebook profile. Some of the videos are public. I keep my private my my Facebook profile private. Like I don't friend people unless they're actually gotcha. people in my life. So, um, but there are a few public ones. Um, so it's just Rebecca D. Azevedo hyphen Overson. I mean, if you look for Rebecca Overson, you're just gonna find me. But I do have um, I do have a, a Facebook page that I haven't. Uh, I don't know. It's just Rebecca D. Azevedo, and that's my piano entertaining thing. So I do plan to post some stuff there, but but I also, if you just add um, request to uh, to whatever you call it, add me on Instagram, whatever it's called. <laughs> it's just Rebecca D. Az is my handle. So it's Rebecca R E B E C C A, and then D like David, E like Edward, A Z like zebra, and that's my Instagram profile. And I pretty much let anybody into that. And I do post videos um, and stuff like that of of not only uh, my piano entertainment, but you know, right, stuff with right. my kids. And then I also post like success stories with my graduates. And so it's kind of like the, the whole Rebecca, you know, so you can definitely, um, see some things, but I don't, I don't really have anything on YouTube. There is actually one video that's called girl kills it singing thrift <laughs> shop. <laughs> and that's me. So if you want to go on YouTube and look up those exact words, girl kills it singing thrift shop at keys on main, um, the, that's the piano bar I work at is Keys on Main, and it's right so on. fun. You're so you're fun. a firecracker. Yeah, so I love your ball of so. energy. I so dig it. <laughs> right, I would have never made it as a police officer. Uh, right? Yeah, Didn't I make a good I think, move? I think you made the right choices here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, right? So fun. I I appreciate this this time. You know, I, my my goal, my mission is fourfold. Okay. I'm here to inspire. I'm here to inspire. I'm here to breathe life into people and help, you know, I'm a hope dealer. You know what I mean? Like I want people to know that what they yeah. want is possible and I will help them get whatever they need in order to get there. The second thing is I'm here to expand. I'm here to help people expand what's possible, expand their awarenesses, ex you know, their awareness of themselves and life and expand their opportunities. Um, I'm here to create, you know, I am an artist. I, I'm a, a creator in so many different ways, whether it's music or my actual artwork that I do or creating successful practices. I love that creative process and I want people to get back in touch with the, their power to create their lives. And I'm here to teach, you know, whatever, whatever comes through me, whatever I've mastered, I want to turn around and give it away. I want to share it. I want to help elevate people. And I'm just, you know, in this particular corner in the massage industry, I'm really out to elevate this industry and help people take massage mm -hmm. therapists seriously by helping massage therapists make a serious, respectable right living, you know? And, um, yeah, I just, it's, I love it. So I really appreciate the opportunity to, you know, to, to share all of that with you and, and just really love impacting people. So, you know, again, you guys, if you want to get in touch with me, you can just, and Instagram, it's Rebecca Diaz, D-E-A-Z. Or um, you can join, please join my free Facebook group. It's called The Art of Building a Successful Massage Practice. And then um, if you want to go to my website, it's rockyourmassagepractice.com. And I do have, um, my program is by invitation only. It's not open for registry. You actually, actually have to apply cool. for it. So there's, um, there's, you know, there's a certain set of prerequisites and criteria. It's all on my website on the work with me page. So if anybody's, you know, curious about what it looks like to work with me or what it takes, I invite you to go there. Look at the um, work with me page. See if you meet the prerequisites, and if you do, you can fill out an application and schedule a 45-minute call with me. And I'll actually, literally, me and you are going to get on the phone, and we're going to look at what your problems are, and if I can solve them, and help you get to where you want to go faster. And if I feel like it's a good fit, and you feel like it's a good fit, you know, that's when I invite mm -hmm. people into the program and get them enrolled and 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 get them, you know, solving those problems immediately, like. I enroll people all the time on those calls. They get started right away. And not everybody's a good fit. I'll be honest one way or the other. I actually reject about 40% of applicants. You know, so so I'm not here to sell people something. I'm right. really here to serve them. And if I really believe it will serve them to work with me, I'll invite them to work with me. Um, and if I don't think it'll serve them or I don't think it's the right time or maybe they're, you know, something just off, then I'll, I'll tell them I don't think this is a good fit and point them to some mm -hmm. other resources and stuff. So it's really... A, 
you know, out of my commitment to add value to people, whether we work together or not. I want those calls to be valuable. And so I offer that, you know, to anybody that's interested and then also have my webinar. Um, maybe I can, I don't know, with your podcast, it's kind of a weird link for the webinar, but, but you, but, uh, if you could just go and like my, my business page on Facebook, which is just called Rebecca Overson, um, then you should be able to find the webinar from there or just message me. I mean, heck, just PM me on Facebook, guys. I, <laughs> I, I answer all my stuff, you know, right? So, so just like, I, you know, happy to be of service and happy to share and, and, and happy to hopefully inspire people that they really can create a practice that nurtures their soul and their bank accounts, you know, and really be able to make a living doing something. Right on. Love. Thanks for hanging. Yeah. I got two turntables and a microphone. <laughs> yeah, my you guys wife named it. It was great. <laughs> two turntables and a microphone. Yeah, because I just, ever since you told me that, I kept running around. I got two massage there. Ever since. I, was, I kept doing that all day. And a microphone. Day I was doing that. And yeah, so. But yeah, this has been a great hang. Thanks. So great. Thanks for hanging out with us. I appreciate it. Oh, absolutely. Having back anytime. We can take a deep dive into any of those, you know, topics and whatever it is that you need. But I just know, guys, I'm, I'm here. And so happy to have my pain and struggles, you know, be put to good use and, and, and save massage therapists from unnecessary right on, pitfalls. Right on. You know, so. Cool, cool. Yeah. So yeah. I think we'll wrap on that then. This has been great. Thank you very much. You've been listening to two massage therapists and a microphone. My name is Mark. Been hanging out with Rebecca. We're so thankful that she didn't decide to uh, sport a badge and a gun. We're happy that she got out of saving kids at a pool. You know, we're, we're, we're loving what you do for the massage therapy community. This is awesome. Thanks a lot. Take care, guys.